Thank you. Okay, hi. Good morning, everybody. This is Cheap Security Audits with Linux Live CDs. I'm your speaker today, Beth Lynn Iger from Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science. I would like you to actually listen to this talk. This means I'm going to ask you to hold all your questions till the end. I would prefer it not if you had side conversations. Please, please, Make sure that your cell phones are unaudible at this time. And if a call arises, please escort yourself out. Do not answer the call in the lecture hall. And if at all possible, please make your computer not audible either. And this is a challenge to you. I challenge you to not use your electronic devices if at all possible, because I'm giving you an opportunity to learn something valuable that you can take back to your employer and it will uh, perhaps be very profitable to you later. Therefore, it's to your benefit to actually listen now. Thank you. You might be a system administrator if. Um, by raise of hands, who actually has the job title of system administrator? Anyone here? Good. Um, it, a lot of people do system administrative tasks who aren't necessarily given the job title of system administrator. They might be given the title of help desk, IT support, but if Definitely, if you're the only IT person in your organization, even if your organization is your family, then you are the system administrator, and therefore you're responsible for all the data and the network, etc. So what do we mean by cheap? It's not going to cost you a lot of money to do a security audit with a Linux Live CD because these tools are open source and they do not cost anything out of the box. And it's not going to cost you very much time either. What exactly do we mean by an audit? We're just going to check out and observe the conditions that are there. We're not going to get too much into the nitty gritty of fixing something. And we're not going to get involved with a long-term monitoring project. All we're doing is just observing the conditions right now. Recommended Linux Live CDs. So at this point in time, I'm recommending the most recent Nopix, which is 402. And I include on that bullet point 3.7, because if you have some really old hardware, 3.7 is the last Nopix disk with the 2.4 kernel. Um, Nopix STD is an oldie but goodie, but it is definitely starting to show its age. There's a live CD distribution called Backtrack, which is uh, formerly known as WAX, which is formerly known as WAPIX. Whenever these guys finally get a direction and commit to it, I'm sure that they're definitely on the right track to having a very quality sort of live CD product. 
it's my understanding that Backtrack is based on a distribution called Slackware, which may be of more interest to you. There's also a distribution that's specific for doing this stuff called Auditor from remoteexploit.org. Um, again, I, I am only recommending the, not, the most recent topics because of the release cycles. You may find out that Auditor has a new release and you may want to switch to them. Um, Auditor is also based on Opix. And then there's another CD that is called the System Rescue CD. And the System Rescue CD may not come to mind when you're thinking of security audits, but I have an example as to how that particular CD would be better for the application versus Nopix or something else. Other CDs that you may want to have on your bench. Um, just burn a CD with the most recent check rootkit type programs. You may want to have your favorite operating system installation media or perhaps that particular OS's rescue CD. There is something that the Windows folks are calling the Windows Nopix, which is BART PE. But I must warn you that this is, uh, that part, BART PE is not open source. So you have to read the licensing and be careful before you proceed with that. So why would you go about doing a security audit? Um, your users are surely not going to ask for it. It will be considered somewhat of a, an intrusion of privacy to them, and <laughs> they might get a little paranoid that you're going to break something as you're doing the security audit. Management is not likely to ask for your security audit either, but they might feel urged to comply to some sort of legal uh, standards or customer standards or maybe somebody that they want to partner with in the future may have standards for your site. Um, I've also heard of insurance companies wanting some sort of audit or some sort of disaster plan to be in place. Um, another way that management could pay it, start to pay attention is there's a security incident that occurs and that would certainly draw their attention. Um, but the equation I have down here is vulnerability plus exposure equals liability. Perhaps once you sell the cost benefit of doing this, since it's really only going to cost time in the long run, that this m may be considered valuable. So you need to initiate the process. So that means you have to get away from the keyboard and perhaps deal with some of the, what we call in the field is the soft topics of system administration. And once you call it a project, you can start to build a committee. And these are the types of buzzwords that I hear in some sites might actually get somebody a raise. And you definitely need to get management approval first. As much as I love Grace Murray Hopper's advice, it's much easier to apologize than ask for permission. So, excuse me, please leave. Thank you. So, um, why do we need to ask permission to consider, continue with our security audit? Proceeding without permission could be illegal. Now, I'm a lawyer and I do not know every statute in every state but the PA Title 18, Chapter 
76 computer offenses basically states that you cannot view, transmit, do anything that could be possibly a privacy violation to a user's data. And um, also in my geographic area, you cannot be one of those types of war drivers who just so happen to conveniently notice an open wireless network and knock on that person's door and say, I want to sell a, a security solution for you. That is also illegal in my area. So you, another reason why you, you definitely need to tell your management, because you could cause havoc on your network, but you, because you could possibly create a denial of service attack sort of situation while you're auditing. And you also don't want to be blamed if for some coincidence that something bad happens while you're doing the security audit that has nothing to do with your security audit. So unless you have a published policy announcing that this is going to be done, uh, you're already invading your user's privacy, which again may be illegal. And another reason is you do want to strive towards a code of ethics, especially if you're a professional system administrator. So how do you go about doing this? You need to document what systems will be added, what tools you'll be using, when you're doing this, if you find something, are you allowed to further investigate, and exactly how you've informed the users. Do you have a terms of service agreement that already uh, has the legal authority that you've already signed off on this, or do you need to go ahead and inform your users at this time? And it would be good to have this document all in, in one place that you've taken care of these steps before you proceed. So I'm going to give you four scenarios. This is the first one. You've been hired at, by a small company to be the sole IT person. Nothing has been documented, so no one knows what each computer does. The risks. So no one knows to knowing the administrator or root passwords. Somebody must have known it at some point, somewhere, because then the password wouldn't have been set. But uh, you don't know if the people who are saying, I don't know the password, do they really know the password or not? There are several neglected systems on your network that your, uh, the former system administrator may not have been taken care of. Meanwhile, uh, all your users are typing passwords, adding data to these neglected systems. So how do you proceed with this audit? Use Ethereal to capture the packets for a few days. I would give it about 72 hours. Use Nmap to document the open ports. That's a very quick way to do it. But I suggest that you also run Nessus for a couple days as well. The things that you should look for is you need to identify the IP addresses on the network, what services are running, remote logins, who are these people? Do they have a right to be on your network? So this is in a screenshot of Ethereal. So you have the source destination, what kind of traffic is happening here, and the, if you follow the what kind of traffic is ha happening here through many of the various sorts, it allows you to uh, sort through the 
traffic so you can identify, okay, somebody has uh, typed their password at FTP, and lo and behold, here's their password. So you have the documentation that proves to somebody, yes, you do need to change your password because here it is, and no, you cannot use FTP anymore, for example. And that map. So this is a very quick way to do a port scan of a particular IP address. This allows you to just get the command line text output. But if you want something more verbose, you want Nessus, because then you can do multiple IP addresses with plain English descriptions as to what uh, services could possibly be vulnerable and why. So here's one quick fix, just because it's so easy with Nopix. While you're there, you can go ahead and change your passwords, even Windows passwords. So after observing, you'll, you can make a graphical map of each node uh, in your network. You may decide to retire some machines. You may want to uh, somehow replace the machine. Now, if it's at all possible for the more mission critical systems, find another piece of hardware and rebuild it from the ground up. That way, you can have less downtime whenever you slide uh, the new box into place. But if you have all the time in the world, wipe and reinstall works just as well. And another thing that you may discover while you're observing is that the receptionist desktop is also the file server. And the reason why it goes down every night at 4 p.m. is that's when she gets off of work. You also may discover that your boss's niece, who also works there, is sharing MP3s to the entire interweb, and that's why you have so much bandwidth costs. So be prepared that this could possibly be political after you've observed some conditions. Scenario two, you notice an unusually la large amount of bandwidth usage coming from an IP address that belongs to a Linux desktop. The risk, someone could have stolen your IP address and your bandwidth for that matter. The user could be abusing resources by downloading or sharing software or other media files, which may be pirated. The system may have been cracked, and the cracker and his friends may be stealing your bandwidth. So how to do the audit? Boot Nopix on another system and run Ethereal to log the traffic. This will allow you to realize as to exactly what sort of event is going on. Make a note of the MAC address. This is something Ethereal allows you to do. It not only reports the IP address, but it, uh, it notes the MAC address of the IP address that's sucking all the bandwidth. If you can safely uh, remotely log into the system, then use uh, the types of tools like PS, LS, OF, and TOP. This is assuming that this is a Linux desktop, for example, to see what's going on. Also, you may want to verify the MAC address uh, while you're there with ifconfig. And while you're logged in, uh, check for rootkits. Scenario number three. Your employer has recently implemented a policy of stronger passwords, and you have been asked to check for compliance. 
Weak passwords could lead to internal and external cracking. How to do the audit? Novix STD has password crackers. There's John the Ripper. And for Windows passwords, they include PWL9X. Scenario number four. You need to evaluate the data contents of an unknown hard drive before its disposal. The risks. Possible sensitive data could be lost or fall into the wrong hands. I'm not talking just about personal data, but I'm talking about your business's intellectual property as well. So, and this is where the system rescue CD comes into play. It allows you to mount many different file systems. From there, you can browse the file system and perhaps make a determination as to whether or not this data is worth keeping, depending on how much time you have. You may not have the time to do that right now. So you may want to make an image of the entire drive with uh, the tool part image. And once you're done uh, dragging the image off of that disk, you can use a tool called wipe which securely removes the files from uh, the entire disk. And after the, all that's done, you may want to take a hammer to it as well. And that's all I have to say, folks. I would like to give a special thanks to my husband, William Eicher. Um, he's been very supportive of me this week. I'd also like to thank my home log Western Pennsylvania Linux users group. I'd also like to thank Usenix and the League of Professional System Administrators because these are the folks that I've learned the most from uh, that have contributed to these slides. I'd also like to thank Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science for sending me here. And I'd also like to thank the Ohio Linux Fest because if it wasn't for them, I would not have known how awesome today's event is. And I'd also like to thank Nauticon 3. Please applaud these guys. <laughs> Great show, huh? And I'd also like to plug, if you haven't checked it out already, there's a a flyer in the terminal room. It's called HackerCon Wi-Fi Hijinks. This is a pamphlet where it describes as to how one can get compromised on a hostile network. And it's nicely put together. And a lot of the URLs of the tools that I suggested are on the back of this flyer. So I'm willing to take questions at this time. And I have tickets. Oh, yes. Uh, sure. Uh, there is a new later version of uh, Mavics. I think Mavics 5 was released a couple weeks ago. Yeah, but um, I believe that's only for the DVD. I could be wrong. Uh, no, it is a DVD, you're correct. Yes, th I, I was restricting it to regular CDRs uh, just because you might have older hardware. Okay. Um, another thing, too, I uh, recently just found out that uh, Auditor and um, Wax have now combined into a single uh, new uh, security tool CD called Backtrack. Oh, that's what Backtrack is. Yeah, that's what Backtrack is. Yeah. Okay, yes, definitely. That's going to be very cool. Yes. Another, it's not really a question again, it's a comment also. Oh. Um, on the um, Nessus tool, they've recently uh, closed the source on that or closed development on that, but there is a fork now uh, that was originally called G Nessus, Nessus that's been renamed Open Pass. So open Pass? Open Pass. Open VAS. Open VAS. Yes. Very good. Open VAS, he said. All right, Mike, did you have something to say? For a large switching network, would you recommend the Nessus or the Ethereum? I recommend both. 
both trying both pieces if you get. Well, the ethereal logs the actual traffic that's going by. That will allow you to see exactly what's happening in real time. And it will allow you to prove exactly why you cannot type clear text passwords, for example. Now, the Nessus just points out to you what's uh, vulnerable. Uh, Ethereal doesn't point out to you what's vulnerable, but you can draw better conclusions to actually point out exactly why it's vulnerable from the packet trace. Yes? One of the problems with, with starting, thank you, starting with Ethereal or something like that is the massive data you have to deal with from the beginning. So you can start with Etherate to get graphical analysis of the bandwidth. Uh, another thing you can use is Intop, which I've only run it on a BSD platform, but it'll actually uh, show all the, the, it collects data. It'll show you uh, the amount of traffic between IPs, uh, what's running on those IPs, the sites they're visiting, and things like that. So then it allows you to drill down and start using Ethereal. Because once you hit Ethereal, you've got to start picking through a lot of data and filtering to see what you're looking it for. It would be really awesome if that was on the um, uh, the free uh, SD. I think they pronounce it that way. It's the free SBIE. Free SBIE is the name of the live CD for the free BSD folks. You want to say anything about um, with snippets and so forth, inserting yourself into the past, because most modern networks are going to be switched networks, so you're pretty much going to see the only things that are coming down your particular line, things like you know, hooking up to the mirror port of your, uh, your switch or, uh, or using art poisoning techniques to be able to put yourself in the uh, middle of the path so you can actually see more of the traffic that's actually going across the network. I'm sorry, was there a question there? No, I, I was just okay, that was the comment. What, 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 uh, what technique do you what use? What art poisoning to get techniques? In the mirror, do you use like mirror ports and your switches, or do you use like art poisoning techniques to, insert, to be able to see more of the traffic? Because the way we, our network is set up is everything is switched. So pretty much to see someone else's uh, plain text passwords, or to notice someone else is using plain text passwords on the network, you'd actually have to be between them and the, uh, the switch. Mm -hmm. Or. Um, I'll poison between them or be hooked up to like a mirror board on the switch. What, uh, yes, exactly. Um, the, the part of the reason why I call this cheap is you're only going to see what's behind the one switch. I, I actually, I'm sorry, I'm still thundering. I built a box that has uh, an old uh, 3Com 24 port hub and a little compact laptop. And I just go in and switch network and pull everything out for a day, plug it into my hub. And I can watch all the traffic that way. So all those old, you know, ten port hubs or whatever you have sitting around, they're great to hang on to. I got a few just that. Question. Yeah. So if you jack in between the switch network and the outside connection, at least you're watching what's going out in your network. It's like a nice diagram from Ethernet tapping to you to get the same functionality. But you have to have two network cards to be able to see both is sending in. Yeah. Not the incoming. Well, the problem with the mirror port is a lot of mirror ports don't show traffic both ways. Oh, the HP Pro curve that I touched before would only show like incoming data. It wouldn't show out. Of the I was aware of that. They have corrected that in later versions. So they have? Yep. Yeah. But on a 50 port switch, you can only see half the ports on this side with a monitor port or half the ports on this side. But they did fix that. That was annoying. Cool. So, anyone else from this side of the room? <laughs> Come on, you guys come up with your question. Okay, thanks very much. <laughs>